So let's start with one of the most common things. And patients will come in and they will say, my hand keeps falling asleep or I'm having numbness and tingling. Um, oftentimes, the patient will even be able to tell me which fingers are getting numb. Sometimes it's some fingers, sometimes it's the others, sometimes it's the whole hand. And all of that is useful information um, when, we, when we try and make the diagnosis. The other common thing that patients tell me is that they often wake up at night in the middle of the night from a deep sleep with a numb hand. And they may have to take their hand and kind of shake it out in order to get feeling back. And this can be a pretty um, burdensome thing because sleep is important for lots and lots of reasons. And if your sleep cycle is getting interrupted multiple times a night, every day, um, it, it can be pretty debilitating. Um, another common thing I'll hear is certain positions like holding the steering wheel, talking on a phone, um, will, will cause their, their hand to go numb. Um, and oftentimes this is accompanied with kind of a dull, deep ache, or even kind of a crampy type feeling or swollen type feeling in the hand. Um, that's often worse when they first wake up in the morning. Uh, um, and a lot of times that pain is going to kind of be localized to the base of your palm or your wrist. So, uh, and then sometimes patients will also say that they are having some, some weakness, um, so what this is, is typically carpal tunnel syndrome. So that's the most common condition that a hand surgeon sees. It's, it's very prevalent. And what it is, is a pinched nerve in the wrist. Um, and as that nerve travels down your arm, it enters what's called the carpal tunnel. And I'll show you a diagram of the carpal tunnel in a second. But there's usually inflammation within that carpal tunnel, which causes increased swelling, which can irritate the nerve or compress the nerve. Some of the risk factors for getting carpal tunnel syndrome, it is more common in females. Um, it's about a two to one ratio, though males do certainly get it. So, um, you know, the male sex is not, is not immune to carpal tunnel syndrome. It's certainly more common in obesity. An uh, interesting thing is that it often shows up in pregnancy, um, and that's because some of the hormonal changes that go on um, while you're pregnant can cause increased swelling in your body, which can result in that pinched nerve. And then the two main medical conditions that carpal tunnel syndrome is associated with is hypothyroidism and diabetes. And those are two things that, you know, if I notice that uh, you have that medical history of um, either diabetes or hypothyroid, I kind of, before we address the carpal tunnel syndrome, I, I make sure that those are being taken care of as well. So this is a diagram of your hand. And if you can see, it might be difficult to see my mouse, but the yellow structure kind of in at the base of the palm there, that's the median nerve. And that's the nerve that gets pinched in carpal tunnel syndrome. And within the carpal tunnel are all the tendons that bend your fingers and thumb. So if there's any extra swelling in that area, the nerve is the softest structure and that is what gets pinched. So the photo on the right is um, just a different view and you can see that yellow structure in the nerve and then all the kind of hollow circles are the tendons. And you can tell that the bottom of and sides of the carpal tunnel are formed by some small bones in your wrist. And the roof of the carpal tunnel is a ligament that goes across those bones. So conservative treatment for carpal tunnel syndrome usually starts with nighttime bracing. And the type of brace that I recommend is one that immobilizes the wrist and keeps your wrist in what we call a neutral position. So keeping your wrist straight. The reason why we do it at night is oftentimes when you sleep, you may curl your wrists and that can compress 
the carpal tunnel and make your symptoms even worse. That's why patients will wake up at night with a numb hand uh, quite frequently. Um, daytime stretching can help. A way to stretch the carpal tunnel is to bend your wrist back, um, like in this photo. That will help stretch some of the tendons, may de decrease some of the swelling in the area and relieve a little pressure on that nerve. Um, and then the last thing, and, and I really get asked about this a lot, um, is kind of what are some of the work-related uh, reasons for carpal tunnel syndrome? And one of the big ones can be how you're sitting at your desk. So a good way to potentially improve your carpal tunnel syndrome is making sure your ergonomics are optimized. So this is a great photo of, of someone working at a computer um, with really good ergonomics and all, you know, obviously she has very good posture. She's sitting up straight. Um, she has her computer screen at a good level. So she's not having to bend her neck or, or extend it. Um, but I will kind of clue you into where the keyboard is. And you can tell that her wrists are nice and straight. She's not bending the wrist back. She's not bending the wrist like this. Um, so keeping the wrists in a neutral position is, is very helpful. All right, so carpal tunnel syndrome, it's been going on for a little while. You've tried some of these things at home. When should you come in and see me or another hand surgeon? Um, the first thing is if you're getting nighttime numbness despite bracing. And bracing, I usually like patients to try it for at least three or four weeks to see if that improves their symptoms. If you've tried it for a month and things have not significantly improved, then I think that would be a good idea to come and see me. Um, and no one likes not getting a full night's of sleep, myself included. The other big things um, where I would like to see it sooner rather than later are if you find that you're picking something up and frequently dropping it because you either don't have the strength or uh, you don't feel what is in your fingers. A lot of patients will tell me that they can't pick up coins um, because they don't have that fine feeling in their fingertips anymore. Um, if you start noticing you're having weakness with gripping something, pinching something, that's something um, that's pretty important. And then if you're having full-time numbness where that hand is just staying numb, no matter if your wrist is bent straight, whether it's day, night, that sort of thing. Those last three things are um, a little more concerning symptoms than kind of the numbness that will go away when you shake your hand. Um, those are things that I would want to treat sooner rather than later so you don't get any permanent damage to that nerve. And this is a, a, a photo just showing that that nerve does control some of the small muscles in your hand and and um, um, uh, sorry, that nerve controls some of the small muscles in your hand. One of the main muscles that moves your thumb, so it's quite important. And you can see in this photo where those blue arrows are pointing is this patient has probably had carpal tunnel syndrome for quite a long time. And since that nerve has been compressed or pinched for a long time, it's actually caused that muscle to atrophy and they're probably experiencing quite a bit of weakness when they move their thumb. So what can we do about carpal tunnel syndrome? Luckily, a lot. Um, one thing that we can potentially try is doing a steroid injection. A steroid is a powerful anti-inflammatory and so what a steroid injection does is it decreases the inflammation in the carpal tunnel. So it's not changing any of the anatomy or structure of the carpal tunnel, but it may help decrease some of the inflammation in the tendons around the carpal tunnel. So this is a, a good representation of what that injection looks like. I use the smallest needle possible and I inject a little bit of steroid and a little bit of local anesthetic directly into the carpal tunnel. And that can 
frequently give you some relief for um, a decent period of time. But if your carpal tunnel syndrome is more severe, it will often give you relief for three or four weeks, and then your symptoms may return kind of right away. Um, so if that's the case, we kind of move on to doing a surgical carpal tunnel release. And I'll go into what that involves a little bit more now. So carpal tunnel release, the way that I address um, how to surgically treat carpal tunnel syndrome um, the first thing is I do it with you wide awake, only using local anesthetic. So you come to a surgery center. I inject local anesthetic in the area where I'm going to be working. You don't get an IV. You don't get put to sleep unless you really want to. But it allows you to have the surgery, not have any of the downsides of general anesthesia, like nausea, vomiting, grogginess. It makes the whole process quite a bit quicker because you're not having to recover from that anesthesia after surgery. So frequently, you know, I will have you come in, I'll numb you up, we'll do the surgery and then, um, Oh, oftentimes 10 or 15 minutes after the surgery, you're walking out to your car and you can even drive yourself home if you'd like. Um, of course, I take it on a patient by patient basis. And if you're at all nervous about being awake during the surgery or um, being aware of what's going on, we have other approaches. But I'm a big fan of, of doing it with you awake. It really takes out a lot of the hassle of not being able to eat the day of surgery and some of the downsides of, of general anesthesia. So first I have you come in and in the pre-operative holding area uh, where the nurses will see you and interview you and then I will come and see you and I will inject local anesthetic right around the area where I'm going to be doing the surgery. Um, it's typically one bee sting to get the first amount of um, anesthetic in there. And then I can kind of strategically inject the rest of it through areas that I've already numbed up. So patients usually tolerate it quite well. And um, I think, again, it really, the upside is, is not having general anesthesia. Um, the, uh, once we're in the operating room, the way I do this surgery is we call it endoscopic. So what that means is using a camera. So what that, the advantage of that is I only need to make about a centimeter incision kind of at the base of your palm. And then after I make that incision, I'm able to carefully dissect down to the carpal tunnel. And then I'll stick the camera within the carpal tunnel and it's a device just like this picture. And that, what that camera shows me is the roof of the carpal tunnel or that ligament that compresses the nerve. And so using that camera, I'm able to see exactly what I want to, to release. And as I'm watching it, I can deploy a blade to relieve the pressure off of that nerve and go from there. Um, I close the incision with dissolvable stitches. Uh, you just need to keep the dressing on for two or three days and then you can take it off and start washing your hands and doing everything um, about your life that you normally do. So the recovery is, is pretty fast. Um, I usually tell patients that they can expect some soreness in their palm um, for about two weeks. If you are doing a lot of construction or manual labor, I may recommend you take off work for that two weeks. But if your job is mostly at a computer or talking on the phone, it's the sort of thing where you can really go back to work um, pretty much right away. So most patients will go back um, within a couple of days. The other thing for pain control, uh, this way I think there is less pain than doing an open carpal tunnel release. And I typically just recommend Tylenol and ibuprofen um, and that works very well for, for most patients. So I'm just going to check in here and see if there are any um, questions. So I see there is 
one question about um, arthritis, and I would say I, we will get to that um, shortly once we kind of start talking about some arthritis. So I'm not forgetting about you. We'll get we'll get to it. All right. So if we're finished with carpal tunnel syndrome, I'll kind of move on to the next thing. Um, oh, sorry, I have more. What to expect after surgery? Uh, I kind of went over this soreness in the palm for two weeks. Um, all of your fingers and thumb are completely free in the dressing. Um, usually patients will tell me that after surgery, that's the first time they've gotten a full nights of sleep in months or sometimes even years. And if you had any numbness or any full-time numbness or weakness in your hand prior to surgery, that is what takes longer to recover. And we can actually see recovery of that nerve up to a year or even 18 months after surgery. So the tingling goes away quite quickly and then the return of strength or, or any uh, sensation is shortly thereafter. Um, okay, uh, yeah, we have a question. If, if I have carpal tunnel syndrome, is it common to have cold fingers? So that's a good question. Um, it typically can feel like you have cold fingers. There may be other issues um, related to your circulation that are causing those fingers to be cold. So that's, that can be a difficult kind of um, how, what's causing those cold fingers. Sometimes the carpal tunnel syndrome can give you the sensation that you're having cold fingers. Um, but it's not the only reason that you could have cold fingers. So that's something that we'd probably need to investigate a little bit further um, and, and kind of evaluate you in the office. Um, another question, any side effects from surgery or complications that may happen? Yes, that's a great question. Um, with any surgery, there's always potential for complications or side effects. So I'll try and address those pretty quickly. Side effects, I think the main side effect, and I don't even know if I'd classify it as a side effect, but sometimes when that nerve has been pinched for a really long time, like several more months or even years, once the pressure is relieved on that nerve, that nerve may actually have a little bit more sensitivity or decrease sensation than prior to um, prior to the surgery. So you may even feel like some of your sensation worsens for a little while, um, and then it gradually gets better after that. And the reason why is that nerve gets a certain amount of blood flow, and if that blood flow has been restricted for a while, once that nerve starts getting blood flow again, it can be painful and you may even have um, some worse sensation. Um, so that's the main side effect. I would say soreness is a side effect, but it is surgery. So having, having some, um, some soreness is, is to be expected. The main complication is, um, is potentially cutting the wrong thing. And um, you know, there's a difference between endoscopic carpal tunnel releases and open carpal tunnel releases. An open carpal tunnel release is making a bigger incision kind of at the base of the palm and directly visualizing the nerve. The way you do it with carpal tunnel syndrome is that you do not directly visualize the nerve within the carpal tunnel, but you make sure you have a clear view of what you're cutting. And that's where I would say it's important to find a hand surgeon who has quite a bit of experience doing endoscopic carpal tunnel releases, if that's the route you want to go. Because um, the most important thing is do no harm. So I take great care to make sure that if I can't see something well, I take extra time to make sure I can see it well so I don't cut anything. Um, there are some small nerve branches in that vicinity, and if you're not looking out for them, they, they could potentially be cut, and that would be, um, that would be bad. So um, that's, that's kind of the main complication um, of, of carpal tunnel um, 
surgeries, but those are very rare. I would say much less than 1%, especially if the surgery is being done by um, a fellowship trained hand surgeon with, with experience in carpal tunnel, endoscopic carpal tunnel release. All right, last question. Do you need physical therapy after carpal tunnel surgery? That's another great question. Um, typically, no. I give you an instruction sheet with some exercises to start right after surgery. So you go home with that instruction sheet. Um, you're not being put in a splint or a cast or anything. So I encourage you to do those exercises and start moving the hand and wrist and fingers um, to prevent stiffness. So I would say it's less than 5% of the time that I need to send a patient to physical therapy or um, a certified hand therapist after I do this procedure. So great questions. Thank you for participating. I'd say, Let's move on to the next topic. Okay.